Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to yet another open source training session. We are incredibly grateful that you'll be spending the next hour with us. It is the second last session for 2023. It really is true that when you're having fun, time simply flies. Um, but tonight we've got a jam-packed session for you talking about a very relevant topic affecting all of us within our various leadership roles. And tonight we'll be speaking about psychological safety and the role leaders play in fostering a culture of safety. What you can look forward to in the next 15 minutes or so is us covering a couple of elements and we might not chronologically go through all of these, um, but we do really want to embed um, what the history is around this term we've all heard sort of pre pre-pandemic into sort of the new world of work is psychological safety. What is the concept about? What is it? What is it not? We also want to look at how, psychologi how psychological safety impacts teams and specifically company culture. Um, we're also going to touch on the outcomes that can be achieved. So should you have an environment that really thrives on building um, safety within your team? So what is the measurement around those? And most important, and this is, I think, the, the key of tonight, is some practical and research-based insights on what leaders can do to go and foster a culture of safety. So leaving our session tonight to go and apply it into your team and organization tomorrow, what exactly are we going to leave you with? Um, I do not claim to be an expert on this topic at all. And so therefore, we've partnered with some friends that's going to be chatting to us tonight about this very critical topic. And you're in the very capable hands of Dan Casper and Isis Fabian. Um, Dan and Isis, if you both can get ready as I hand over. But just a little bit around Dan. So um, Dan's the current resident general manager at Install Culture, which is a US-based company. Um, and Dan's a growth architect and innovator and really has a passion for building high-performance teams, but around deriving long-term results, leveraging technology and challenging the status quo. And Dan's been there for about a year now. Um, and also the team has been working on pioneering the world's first culture operating system. So this is looking at marrying people and tech. And I think that is just the world we are in. Um, and Dan, you're really passionate about inclusion, innovation, productivity and results. So we are really grateful to have you here this evening. Hi. And then joining Dan is Isis Fabian. And Isis runs her own consultancy that really focuses on leadership development. But her focus over the last decade is around primary research um, within the workplace culture, primarily the US um, and several other global markets. So Isis is going to really give us some key insights as to what she's been experiencing on the front lines. Um, and her experience is around members of historically marginalized identity groups. And again, I think if, if someone can't show up in their true authentic selves, um, that in itself means could mean that the environment doesn't make someone feel safe to do so. So Isis and Dan, we are privileged that you are here with us this evening. We look forward to learning from you. To our audience members, thank you for your time. The chat box is open. So questions, comments, anything you really want to throw at our speakers tonight. They've been prepped, they are geared, they've got their copy ready. So over to you, Dan. Awesome, thank you, Cassandra. Super excited to be here and hello everyone. As Cassandra mentioned, my name is Dan and I'm gonna be your guide for today. So first and foremost, welcome to our eagerly awaited webinar where we're going to delve into a concept that is truly foundational to any and all high performing teams. And it's also at the heart of really all of your organization's success and the concept of psychological safety. Now, psychological safety is a concept that the global workforce is still very much struggling with, whether that be from a lack of understanding of what is this term, to how do we implement it, to resistance to change, maybe a fear of being overly sensitive, not embracing psychological safety is costing us. And it's going to cost us in things such as higher turnover, decreased innovation, pro poor decision making, and decreased customer satisfaction. But let's look at the other side. Like what does being on a team leveraging this superpower look and feel like? So imagine a workplace where you can freely voice your ideas without fear of judgment, where your unique perspective and background is not only welcome, but it's celebrated and net required. 
Also imagine a place where collaboration is on a daily basis and flourishing. Innovation is at its all time high. Every team member feels valid and heard and seen. So this is the power of psychological safety. So today we're gonna explore why every leader, team member and organization should not just want, but truly needs to understand and embrace the concept of psychological safety. Because when we unlock its potential, we unlock the potential of our people and achieve better business results too. This isn't just a theory. If we truly activate it, it's going to change our business results, period. So welcome to a journey that's going to transform the way you think about work, leadership, and success. So joining me today is our esteemed guest, Isis Fabian. As you heard from her bio, she's a true mover and a shaker in the culture space from researcher to speaker to coach. She's worked with a host of top performing clients that truly attribute a lot of their cultural success and business success to her. We're going to have a great time chatting with her. But before we jump in, I also want to give out to our friends and partners over at Omni HR for hosting the event. They are truly one of the most intentional, focused, results-oriented cult leaders that we have been encountered in, in a very long time. So Lisa, Cassandra, Cindy, thank you very much for having us. And then one small bit of housekeeping before we jump in as well. Uh, as Cassandra mentioned, let's fire up that chat. Let's have some great conversations about some of the topics that we're talking about. Any ideas that come to mind, would love to leverage some of the brain power of, of you on the call as well. So please post questions, ideas, thoughts as we go along in the webinar. In fact, we have some friends that will be monitoring the chat. Scott uh, from my Instill team and also Lisa, I think from the Omni HR team will also be joining us and, and moderating the chat. So hi, Scott. Hey, Lisa. Great to have you here and, and thanks for help monitoring the chat. All right, let's jump in. Isis. How are you? Great to have you here. Doing great. So excited to talk about this. One of my favorite topics. It's just foundational to everything. So many of the outcomes that we want to see in these uh, workplaces. So excited to be here and excited to dive in. Awesome. Well, let's just jump in. Let's do a full jump off the high door, dive right in here. But, you know, the concept of psychological safety, what is it besides a word that I always mess up and how to spell? Like, what is this term that we're tossing out a bunch already in terms of what is it? Like, tell us more. Yeah, so yeah. I think uh, originally came into existence sometime back in the 60s. Um, but in my experience, it was around 2014 when Google came out with a big finding uh, that it was the number one uh, defining characteristic of its highest performing teams after they had done this big assessment, I think of like 150 or something highest performing teams. And um, then everyone started talking about it, right? What What is it? What does it mean? There was a brief period where we all kind of understood it. And it meant the same thing to everyone. And then like with many other terms, as it entered the mainstream, it has been uh, misused, misperceived. Um, I think there's some misconceptions about, about what it is and what it is not. And so uh, moving into what actually is psychological safety, uh, in a very simple definition, it is a, a feature of a culture in which it is safe to learn, it is safe to contribute, and it is safe to challenge the status quo, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, but what it is not is uh, a right to comfort, right? Feeling comfortable. Uh, that's one way I've seen it be really misused and misperceived. Uh, it's actually, that's, that's the antithesis of psychological safety. Um, people will say if someone is, is challenging them or say points out uh, that what they said might have been sexist, for instance, that they don't feel psychologically safe uh, in that environment because they are now uncomfortable, they feel put on the spot. So there's been a misuse, um, a bastardization of the term to protect to comfort. Protect it is not about comfort. It is actually much more about healthy conflict and people being able to speak plainly, to point things out, right? Learn, contribute, and challenge the status quo. Um, and it's also not it's also just not saying whatever you want, even if it's harmful, right? It's not just, oh, you know, deal with it. I'm just going to throw this out there and and let my biases dictate what I'm saying. It does require uh, a level of, of self-awareness and humility from everyone within a given culture uh, for psychological safety to be successful, for it to be um, retained within a culture. Uh, you can't have a lot of big egos right, um, throwing around. You can't have people completely resistant to developing self-awareness or completely resistant to being uh, challenged. All of those things are going to impede a true culture of psychological safety where truly every single person uh, is safe to learn and contribute and challenge the status quo. And I want to just double click on the learn component because this is one that I think uh, gets missed a lot, uh, which is being able to ask questions, right? How many times have you been in a, a big meeting? 
someone says an acronym or they say something, you're like, I have no idea what that is. I feel like I'm supposed to know. And now I'm now I'm not gonna ask the question. Well, someone else, I hope someone else asks it, right? And then when someone does, you're so relieved. You're like, oh, thank God. It actually can make them look confident when they're confident enough to say, you know what? I know that I am not expected to know this in my role. I'm confident enough in front of all these people to say, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. Um, but most people, you know, if you're not in a psychologically safe environment, then uh, everyone's kind of clammed up. No one wants to ask those questions because you're afraid of judgment. You're afraid of reprisal. It's not safe to learn. It's not safe to say, I don't know. It's not safe to ask for input, you know, especially if you're in a higher position um, from, as, from a managerial hierarchical standpoint. Feeling so like I can't ask my direct reports a question, or I can't show that I know less than they do. Um, that's not an environment of psychological safety. Yeah, super interesting. And thanks for the context uh, about this such an important term that we'll jump into a couple of different levels today. We'll also get very much into how do we apply this in our daily life as well, not just the theory, but like how do we activate this within our teams? But really interesting though, because you said this is a concept that's been around since the 60s. This isn't something new. And then Google ran its Aristotle project with kind of it ignited the fire again around it. Like really interesting that this hasn't been just developed, you know, yesterday, it seems like it's really core to the human condition. Like if we look at from like an anthropology or sociological, like a sociology lens, like humans have been building tribes and communities for thousands and thousands of years. There's actually ways that we're wired to go about doing this. And it sounds like while the research is the sixties, this is really one of the core elements to us being human and building tribes and connecting is how do we feel safe in a team to really go to that next level of a relationship where we can make mistakes, where we can try to be innovative, where we can really own our, mis our, our failures, et cetera, to really reach that next level. So really curious, like why is this, you know, if you go to Google, like a lot of this talk about psychological safety now, I, this is, I feel like it's new. It almost feels like a new concept. Has it just been reignited lately? Has Google sparked it? Or just curious, like, why is this so top of mind now? Well, the pace of change is ever accelerating, right? From a technological standpoint, from a cultural standpoint. And if you look back even like, you know, 50 years, companies could afford to be a lot slower. I mean, even just like snail mail, right? You're not, you're not shooting back and forth emails. You're like sending something off and it's a week before you hear back. And there was just a lot more breathing room to uh, let things crash and burn, frankly. I think now there just isn't, there, there's such a, a narrow margin for error and for wasted time, wasted resources, wasted energy that uh, companies are seeing when they have high turnover on teams, when they have um, leaders that aren't really leading, when they're failing to innovate uh, at the same rate as their competitors, they're realizing there, there has to be this missing cultural piece. It's not some other uh, input. It's not, it's, it's not something you can hold in your hands. There is a cultural element that needs to be addressed. And historically, I don't think culture was given that much um, import, right, in terms of intervening in a company. First of all, because it's so hard. It's hard to measure culture. It's hard to define it. Uh, you, you can't just write out your values and say, this is, this is our culture, right? You have to see your culture for what it actually is. And it's hard to intervene. It's hard to change. I think only now have those margins gotten so small and has the rate of change accelerated to such a degree that you can't afford to ignore culture anymore. They can't afford to ignore uh, the, the dynamics that are playing out in how people interact and how ideas are generated and how work actually gets done on teams. And to your point, this has been happening forever, right? All of these concepts, um, another one I've done a lot of research on is sponsorship, which is, you know, advocacy where, where a senior person chooses to advocate for a protege and lift up their careers. That's been going on since the beginning of time, right? It's just, once we name these things and we realize that they're happening, uh, we're able to bring it into conscious awareness and have some conscious intention around building it. There have always been leaders of all kinds in, tri in tribes and businesses, uh, in local communities who just naturally foster psychological safety. Often they have um, a level of self-confidence and charisma. They're not afraid of being vulnerable, right? Vulnerability, as we'll get into, is a big uh, part of it. Uh, but those natural leaders have always been there. Now it's a question of can we get more people, as many managers and colleagues as possible, to adapt to this, to learn to be this way, to build that humility and self-awareness. Um, and I, to, just to answer your your question uh, directly, I just think now companies can't afford to ignore it. Right? So that's why I'm really eager to figure out what it is and how to apply it. Totally. I mean, Zig Ziglar has a quote that I think is really interesting. He says, "Hey, you don't build a business, you build people, and the people build the business." So you could have the best business idea in the world, 
And it's going to fall short unless you can truly ignite the power of your people. And i.e. building a culture and psychological safety is a key element to any and all high performing teams, period, no matter what the environment. So I wonder if it also has to do with, you know, how we have viewed work and how that's been changing as well through the decades, uh, which can be really interesting to look at, too. I would argue psychological safety, um, you know, no matter what the decade has existed in high performing teams, whether they knew the term or not. But I would say our view on work is shifting and we're going less from a, hey, it's something I clock in and clock out of, like, I want my work to have meaning. I want to have an, my work and my life are now being integrated and to a higher degree. And so I wonder if that also has to do more with the concept of just having this known and more top of mind to people because that why, that why statement, that impact statement is so key to igniting, you know, the multi-generations that we have in the workforce now. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I think there's there's two layers to meaning, right? There's the layer of what does this company actually do and what is the impact that it's having in the world and what kind of organization and product am I a part of? And then there's the individual daily experience of to what degree am I able to show up as a human being and not a cog, not a piece of machinery, and actually live up to my live full potential my and deliver on my strengths and bring those to the table, right? To your point, especially after the pandemic where everything got completely blurred together. You know, we have our phones all the time. People bring their laptops on vacation. Like there's no like, more of this uh, totally separate work and life. Even before the pandemic, right before, there were still people who just had desktop computers in the office. And when they went home, they were home. They couldn't access their work, right? That Those days are completely over. And so now it's less of the balance and more of the harmony and also feeling like I'm going to be spending so much of my time doing this. Life, life is short, right? A lot of people confronted their own mortality <laughs> during the pandemic and time with their families and all of that, whether it was the older generation or their um, the kids' generation and thinking, okay, I need to prioritize my time. The time I'm going to spend working needs to be spent in a fulfilling, engaged, interesting way. It can't be clocking in and clocking out. It can't be acting like a, a cog every day. I want to actually be delivering something meaningful and something that reflects my strength and my passion. Actually, um, years ago, I interviewed a leader who was so proud of the team that he had built, right? He finally had a fully staffed team. He was very high up in a Fortune 100 uh, tech company. And he was like, how can I further like activate this team? Like, I'm just so satisfied <laughs> with the hiring that I've done. And he uh, said to his team, you know what, going forward, I want you all to feel totally confident making your own decisions. And if something goes wrong, blame it on me. If it goes right, you take credit. If you need my help, you can come to me. I'm always here. Like my only job is to support you. So I'm always available no matter what you see on my calendar. Like I am here for you, but please feel confident going forward and just doing what you think is best and making those decisions. And he actually doubled productivity in his line in one year, in just one year. And he fully attributed it to that statement, right? Of course, he had built a great team, right? So a lot of people don't want to hear that advice because they don't, they're like, I don't trust my team. But that's that's something to peel back, right? Why don't you trust your team? Why are you hiring people that are um, you know, maybe mini me's of you instead of complimentary to you that can actually do a lot more uh, than you? And when he presented that to at the company's annual conference, because everyone wanted to hear what he had done in his line, he just got crickets and he ended up leaving that company. And that's a super high performing executive leader, right? Who, who obviously is delivering immense dividends for the organization, and he left the company. I can only imagine how many people from the original team also left as a result of, of him leaving, just not feeling uh, supported in that aspect of psychological safety that uh, he was bringing. And just what does it say that when people are empowered that way, and they can double their productivity, right? It's just one little insight into uh, how many ways we're not fully leveraging the human potential in the workforce and continuing to treat people like like machines and like just another, uh, you know, economic input. Yeah, that's such a great story. And like two pieces I think could be directly applicable to us. And I'm going to put it in my pocket for later too. But, you know, what I gather from that story too is like the traditional hierarchy you is a triangle in nature with the CEO or the, you know, director of the board on top. Sounds like from that story, he got success by flipping that upside down. So he viewed uh, that as the, you know, the CEO of the organization, he actually worked for his people. And that lens flip is such a powerful statement to have that support and understanding from a leader. Like it's not this one way relationship They're If they're a good leader, they're gonna, their goal is to hire smart people and then get out of their way, ignite the fire that's within them, set that vision, that mission, give them the support they need 
introduce pieces of psychological safety and then get again watch the success happen so that was an interesting piece of like how can we flip the traditional hierarchy even if it's just in our minds to more ignite the power of our people uh, and the other pieces that was really interesting from that concept too is the concept from a leader to say hey i'm going to give you the credit and i'm going to take the blame i can't tell you how much i've seen that in my personal background as well, where it just immediately creates like this loyalty to, to that leader when I've seen it happen. Like uh, I have a background in the military and special operations with the Navy. And I remember the, literally, I remember the exact first time that it happened and I made a mistake. I was the platoon commander and my boss, he said it was his fault. He didn't tell me correctly. That was not the case. He told me exactly what I needed to do, but I messed up. As soon as he did that, I can tell you that loyalty was, it was a ride or die moment for me. And I still remember it, you know, 15 years later. So how can we continue to facilitate psychological safety as a leader to ignite more confidence, loyalty, and trust and innovation with our teams? I think that's such a great story. Yeah, I think yeah. what you're getting at is this idea of superiority and inferiority. And a lot of um, people within the corporate hierarchy fall into this place of thinking, oh, I'm superior to you because I am your superior, <laughs> right? We even use those words, superior. Some people, I think in the military too, will say inferior in how you're just lining up in the hierarchy. But people who take that to heart and really think I am literally as a human being superior to you because I make more money and I have a more senior title um, miss out on a lot of the innovative potential of the people on that. They, they miss those opportunities to uh, take those moments, right? Someone who has that superiority mentality is not going to take the blame for that, right? But someone who has that more um, equity oriented, you know, we're all in this together. I'm playing my role as the supporter of this team <clears throat> is more likely to see, well, I have the uh, kind of reputation that the chips to trade where it's not going to be that big a deal when I take the blame for this. Whereas this new person on my team who just did something wrong, that's going to be really bad for them, right? If they, if, if both for their trust with me, but also with the organization, you know, I don't want them to be known as like the first thing they did was make a big mistake. And um, that's going to, you know, tarnish everyone's perception of them. Whereas I already have a reputation. No one's going to remember this a week from now, right? So they're really thinking in terms of what's best for the broader organization, what is best for the team and recognizing the intangibles like that trust building that you just can't put a price on and you often can't, you know, measure quantitatively uh, when you create that kind of, you know, safety net uh, for your team and you're, you're giving them the opportunity to uh, spread their wings. So in terms of how you can actually um, build that, I mean, we can, I know we'll get into kind of practical takeaways uh, more toward the end, but I'd say in broad strokes, right, it's showing that vulnerability, it's showing humility, it's not having the hubris to think that you know so much more than everybody on your team. Again, especially with the rapid rate of change that we're seeing culturally and technologically, it is no longer true, if it was ever true, that the best ideas are coming from the people at the top of the company, right? They can come from anywhere. And some of the most talented people are gonna be in the most junior of the company because often they grew up with the technology that's making um, such an impact and is so now important to the company's success. They have that you know digital native relationship. That was a big thing. I know when millennials came into the workforce, and now what about uh, Gen Z, right? Having a totally just different orientation and worldview. They had the pandemic take away high school in person graduation and college in person and all of these all the things that they um, you know took for granted. That that really affected you know their their entry into the the working world and the way that they think. And the world is, is changing, right? to your point. It's just like, you can't afford to take this command and control. Everything flows from the top to the bottom. You have to have a very efficient, effective, bottom up and top down information flow to be nimble and to survive uh, going forward, just because you can't afford not to with how much things are changing and how much people have woken up to uh, what they actually wanna do with their lives. Yeah, very well said. And I think we're getting into a really, you know, interesting question surrounding psychological safety. Like, why do we need this thing? We talked about what it is, but it's not the history. Like, we're getting into some good meat and potatoes uh, of like, why do we need this thing? And it, it sounds like there's a couple fold that I'm gathering from some of your anecdotes, and, and one of which it's a precursor to trust. Obviously, trust is very important so we can uh, maximize productivity, autonomy, et cetera. We also know from what you're saying, it sounds like it's a precursor to innovation. Like innovation will be stifled if we don't feel safe enough to take risks, uh, to fail, to make mistakes. That's going to be stifled as well. It sounds like it's also a precursor to agility. I would argue resilience and agility is one of the key pieces to being able 
to survive and grow as an organization in today's environment because it is so rapidly changing. Like what else comes to mind to you? Like why would we need these things? I mean, even though we already have essentially a litany of reasons why we do anything else that I missed from what comes to mind for you, Isis, in your research and your background? I think what we have to drive home is that this could argue this is the foundation and the key to high performing teams, right? It's like it's like the prerequisite. You can try to add in other things. You can bring in an organizational change consultant. You can bring in executive coaches, whatever. If you aren't prioritizing psychological safety, you're not recognizing that this is the, the prerequisite to everything else. None of those other efforts are going to make a difference. Nothing else is going to change. And in my work, I very rarely hear people use the phrase psychological safety when they're actually talking about it. <laughs> It comes up in all of these other ways and how they describe their leader, you know, saying this leader is the reason that I'm still here. They, um, there's nothing I can't say to them. You know, they'll say phrases like that. Um, I'm not afraid to uh, be, be honest with them. I'm not afraid to raise any concerns. Um, I feel very safe with everyone on my team. That's the kind of language that they, they use when they're really talking about this core component that is actually psychological safety. So I think that's the most important thing to drive home when we say, why do we need it? It's not this yeah. out there, nice to have, nice to add thing. It's not this new thing. It is foundational to all of the things you want to see in a high performing team and a high performing culture. If without psychological safety, you're not going to have that trust. It takes psychological safety to build trust, right? I think most of us understand trust foundationally. We've probably all had managers that we didn't have uh, any trust with. And we saw firsthand how that affected our work, how it affected um, the energy we would bring, how, you know, if we had a good idea or we had an opportunity to go above and beyond where we might not have brought it to the table because we just didn't have that trust and we knew that there wasn't going to be that um, return mm -hmm on that investment, or you do put that investment in and then you're you're somehow taken for granted or taken advantage of, right? So without psychological safety in the first place, I mean, you're going to have that distrustful relationship, but I don't see how you build trust without having psychological safety. So I think that's the most number one thing is like, it's not new, it's not an extra add on. It's not, oh, we are at this level of maturity. Now let's add psychological safety. Like psychological safety should be as close to the root of the culture of your organization as you can get it. That's a mic drop statement, and I would drop my mic for effect, but then it would make uh, the rest of this conversation slightly more difficult. So I'll refrain from that. But I agree. So if you're you're saying, Isis, hey, if we want to build revenue, if we want to increase our EBITDA, if we want to have a higher uh, net promoter score with a CSAT score, if we want to have any of these foundational metrics, throw them out the window if you don't have psychological safety, because you're not going to achieve that. Or if you do, it's going to be for momentarily in time and you're going to have foundational issues. So I think that's so critical to for us as leaders and culture champions on this call. Like, let's take a look. Like, do we have this? Because if we don't, it makes sense for us to focus on this critical piece before we can achieve any of our other business outcomes. So uh, definitely a mic drop statement for us and how foundational it is. So how do we measure this thing, Isis? Like, it's a cool concept. It's a cool definition. Like, I'm raising my hand and singing along with you. Like, I believe with this. But like, how do we measure this dang thing in today's environment? Well, first, I, I want to um, mention net promoter score, right? And then get into how we measure it. But I think that that's a great, uh, that in terms of how things have changed and how today's workforce operates, like I've seen so many companies that I've worked with really try to control what candidates learn about them when they are um, in the interview process. If they're going to have someone say, if you have candidates from historically marginalized groups or diverse backgrounds, and they want um, someone from an employee resource group to talk to them, they'll like really be careful about who they allow them to talk to or whatever, and don't realize that these candidates are reaching out to people on LinkedIn that they have, you know, one degree of separation from. Be like, hey, I'm interviewing at this company. What's it like? You know, I'm black. You're black. Right. And they'll have those conversations on the side and they are about psychological safety. And that's not just for people from historically marginalized groups, it's everybody. And the younger they are, the more savvy they are about just reaching out and getting that informal you know, data gathering. And so you're totally right that without psychological safety, you are not going to get that net promoter score. You can't control the narrative, control the information flow about your organization the way you used to be able to, right? I mean, think even like 20 years ago, how easy it was for a company that just had good commercials and <laughs> was known for making a lot of money. So they probably paid pretty well. That, that I mean, how much more did you need to, to, to uh, you know, millennial right now? 
college, right? college, right? So uh, that has definitely changed. And so to your point, I just want to <laughs> reiterate that, like all of those factors that you just raised, all of those uh, metrics are absolutely right. impacting right. my culture today. To me, psychological safety and culture are just kind of like two sides of the same coin because psychological safety and the lack of it plays such an enormous role in the culture that you have. And in terms of how we measure it, you know, until recently, I would say you really only had self-reported uh, employee data, and that's still very useful, right? You can do 360s. Uh, 360s, I think, are really important in general, but you have to act on that data. Bad to collect 360 data and not take action on it. Uh, for those who don't know, 360 um, is when you have, you know, not just managers rating their direct reports, but you also have peers rating each other and you have direct reports rating their managers and submitting that um, all upward to the manager's manager. And you can do this with questions like, I can speak my mind without fear of reprisal. My ideas are valued by my team and manager. Um, I get to co-create on my team. I'm not afraid to ask questions. I'm not afraid to admit I don't know something. I'm empowered to deliver my full potential. These are all questions that will pretty closely get at, is this person in a psychologically safe environment uh, on their team? And I know with Instill's platform, I'm very excited <laughs> that we'll finally uh, be able to enable this measurement in a way that doesn't require just the self-reporting from employees and can give us like a whole new uh, data set that I think in terms of, you know, you, previously you can't observe meetings, you can't measure what's going on in them or the language people are using. Um, so I'd love to hear from you, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> but what your thoughts are, what that that future of measurement uh, might look like beyond the employee self-reported data? No, that's a, it's a great question and still very relevant, right? I think the employee reported information does give us very useful information on sentiment and what's top of mind for them. So that isn't going anywhere. Um, you know, before we built and still the platform, we did research and we worked with Stanford, Berkeley, Caltech, U.S. Army Research Lab, so some top organizations and universities here in the states to understand how culture has shifted. Uh, in the past few years? How do we build teams differently? What should we be looking at or measuring or doing differently to truly ignite the power of our people to drive business results? So I actually jotted down a few notes while you were speaking here too, of kind of like a quick diagnostic that we can do in our next meeting as leaders, like to start to assess like where are we at with psychological safety? So uh, bear with me while I read this, but uh, how many questions are being asked during your meetings? Uh, is it engaging conversation or is it just one way? So start mm -hmm. to pay attention a little bit of how many people are asking questions or who is asking questions. Is it the same person every time or is it a good gambit of others as well? Um, team doesn't feel comfortable owners owning mistakes. So are people, if they make some mistakes, uh, which is part of it, like it's part of the game. If we're not making mistakes, then we're never innovating. If we're never innovating, we're going to be obsolete as a business. So critical to make mistakes, but do people own them or do they say, oh, that was the sales department or no, that was the marketing department. So look out for ownership in your team meetings as well. Do executives dominate conversation? So we've all been in the meeting where the boss just sits and lectures at you and everyone's eyes gloss over. Maybe it's because it's 5 p.m. on a Friday and they should be more intentional about where they're saying these, or maybe because the lack of psychological safety is we don't really want to engage. We don't feel safe to engage or challenge or raise ideas with the executive. So to keep an eye out for that. And last, just to keep it in uh, one more and short and sweet here is how many different points of view? Are everyone agreeing? Oh, I agree, I agree, I agree. And we get to the meeting in 20 minutes uh, out of 30 minute meetings because there's no differences of opinion, no differences of belief. Like to your point before ISIS, like it's critical to hire differences of opinions, background, ethnicities. Like we know from research that is critical to high performing teams. So if we're not seeing any healthy discussion surrounding different ideas, pushback, disagreements, like that is also critical to psychological safety. So maybe you may uh, in your next meeting, take some notes and, and see how that's coming across. Now, in still, we also, uh, we, we believe like those active ways to gather, gather sentiment are, are super helpful, but we also know that survey fatigue is real. We know if in low psychological safety environments, you may not respond correctly because for fear of your job or fear that you're going to get, you know, thrown under the bus if I respond incorrectly. So we use sentiment analysis, natural language processing. We actually use those exact same questions uh, with some tools, coaches that can join meetings. And we actually give scores on your culture, one of them being psychological safety. But, you know, whether you know, you're looking for new tools or not, there are some really interesting modern ways to help us tangibly measure a lot of these culture vital signs that have been so difficult for us to put um, you know, data behind in the past. And so keep an ear out and there are, you know, if technology and leveraging that is important, 
check out. There's a bunch of different solutions now that could be really interesting to get us very solid data on psychological safety. And I just want to emphasize something you that came through in what you were sharing, Dan, which is the importance of the people with the least amount of power in oh. these uh, environments and in meetings, right? It's not, um, you know, I worked with one <laughs> team that was was very low on the psychological safety front, and it, and it was a big problem. But the the leaders of this team, um, and there was two people leading it, which is a whole that was a whole other problem. <laughs> but they were, um, you know, being told you have to ask the team for input, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. But it was this very superficial, you know, tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. thing. They they as leaders, they weren't prioritizing the psychological safety of the team. So they would only ask for input in situations where there was nothing that anyone would disagree with. It was like very obvious, like, unless anyone disagrees, you know, any this is your chance, anything you want to say, right? But then when it was something that was really controversial or really unreasonable or didn't make sense, and you just knew everybody in that room had something to say, they would, you know, breeze right through it, move on to the next thing, or make sure it was a short meeting so there was no time uh, for anyone oh. to dissent, or there were a lot of agenda items uh, that you had to get through, so people felt like they were, you know, going to be derailing the meeting if they were to dissent. So it's really important to look at the actual people without power, right? People with the least amount of power are they being silent, right? When um, things are coming through, all the things that you you were listing, are you hearing any dissenting views? You should be hearing dissenting views all the time. You should be hearing questions, right? I, I think a lot of times leaders think. They don't want to get questions. They don't want to hear dissenting views. They don't want to hear feedback on their approach or their decisions because then they have to change that approach or change the decision. That's often not the case. I'd say roughly half the time, if not more, you're going to get questions or feedback that show, oh, someone on my team is missing context about why this decision was made. I actually haven't given enough context. If they have some other idea about how to do it, I can tell them about how we tried that back in 2017 and here's what happened, right? Give them that information. Give them the opportunity to get that information and not just go off and be all fuming behind your back and telling someone else the team, why didn't we do it this way? This is so dumb, right? People don't know until they know. So you don't have to change things or get walked all over as a manager. This is the type of question that comes up when I do um, workshops on this all the time is like, well, sometimes, you know, you really have to show the hierarchical muscle, right? I mean, sometimes that's really how you have to manage people. I'm like, no, no, it's not about getting walked all over and being a total pushover or being an absolute jerk, right? This is not the, the binary. It's having humility and having intelligence and having confidence in your competencies as a business leader that you can answer people's questions. And if you don't know, you're gonna say you don't know. Or if you need to go get more information, you're gonna tell them, you know what? That is a really good point. And I hadn't thought about that. And thank you for raising that. And I'm going to go get that information. I'll make sure I share what I learned um, with the team by the end of the week, right? To be a leader that can engage with your team that way and recognize that saying I don't know or showing vulnerability does not make you weak and it doesn't make you inferior and it doesn't make you someone that no one's going to respect. The reality is that they don't respect you for relying on command, control, bullying, uh, you know, one-dimensional tactics. They're like, this guy's really insecure. You know, I wonder what his relationship is like with his parents. Right? That's the kind of stuff they're talking about. So, um, yeah, I think to just double click on, on what you um, were sharing about like what to observe. Don't just look at the leaders and say, oh, check the box. They're asking for input, right? What is actually coming up from the, the junior team? What is coming up from the people with the least amount of power? Are you hearing from everybody with the least amount of power or only a couple people? I've also seen that where one person will kind of become the spokesperson for the rest of the team because they maybe have the most um, informal power, the most influence. And then they start to be seen as an agitator and a squeaky wheel by the leadership. And they start to be seen as the problem. And like, how are we going to cut this person out without realizing that the rest of the team isn't talking? <laughs> rely on that person to do all the talking for them. They all might feel that way. So there's all kinds of dynamics that can come up and a lot that we can miss if we're just relying on the leaders and the manager's narrative, which is often all that the hires hear. They just hear it from managers. They have no idea what's actually going on. So I think that's really yeah, important. Totally. And I'm trying to think in my experience, I don't think there's a single leader that has ever flexed the, you know, their authoritative power for me and their rank that I've actually respected as a leader. Like, I don't think there's a single one. Like, if they have to throw that card, it's like the last card that they can play before they're completely out of cards, you know? Um, so that's an interesting piece as well. Like, even in, in, even in, like, the military, like, that same thing. Like, if you ever had to pull rank and it, even an organization as structured as that, like, you weren't a good leader. So that's an interesting piece. But Maybe let's let's flip over the coin, Nice. It's like we're talking about a lot about like how leaders can facilitate 
and build psychological safety. What about that new person? You talked just about like how important that perspective is. Like if I'm the brand new intern on a team and I'm keen on psychological safety, maybe I get it more than others. Like what are some things that I can start to model or do being the low person on the, you know, the totem pole here to, to really start making this part of our culture? Well, I think there's, um, there, there's a limited amount that, that you can do, right, from a position of relatively little power. So I'll just I'll caveat by saying that. But I think it, there's a lot of self-awareness involved, too. If you come in and you're like, everyone else is the problem, or I want all these people to create psychological safety and don't realize the ways that we might ourselves be prone to um, not creating psychological safety, you're not going to be as successful. And in turn, especially someone coming out, you know, right out of college, often coming out of these perfectionist environments, you're coming out of, you know, always marching forward one semester, one grade after another, you're used to working by yourself, turning in assignments, you know, this is true for also from individual contributor to manager. Um, when you have that kind of perfectionist mindset, you tend to not be very tolerant of mistakes. And when you make a mistake, you're gonna beat yourself up. Um, if you're passing blame to others, if you're pointing out other people's mistakes, you are, you are not contributing to that environment of psychological safety, right? So even coming in as a very junior person with relatively little power, you can um, always, you know, speak up in moments, right, where you you might uh, say, "Oh, I really appreciated, you know, the way this person handled um, this issue and, you know, escalated it," or um, "I learned so much from how you handled uh, that mistake," and like, "Thank you for doing that." Or if there's uh, something wrong in an email, right, instead of being like, "That's this person's <laughs> fault," or using the kind of passive aggressive uh, language yeah. to say, like, um, you know following up on this thing, you were supposed to get me and CCing their manager and just trying to make it clear that they're really the one who messed up and like reinforcing those kinds of behaviors that are more competitive and individualistic. Um, I know I'm more sharing what not to do, uh, but the flip side is just giving the benefit of the doubt, um, being very kind, uh, asking questions, showing that you're comfortable asking questions, um, be that person asking questions in meetings, right? When you're new to a team, even if you're not junior, you're just new. That's a time where you get to ask a lot of questions and to really push the envelope on the questions you're asking. Every question you have, ask it, right? What does that acronym stand for? What does that mean? What are you referring to? I don't understand. Can you go over it one more time? Like be the person who is starting to bring that behavior into the organization and let people see how these other people, these other, and other managers um, so long that they've never seen have to react to that. Let them see how they react. Yeah, yeah. Often, well, you know what? I should have gone over what that acronym means or you know what? I apologize. I did not give you guys enough context when I was explaining that, right? Give, create that space for those leaders to start talking that way and get other people to start thinking, oh, maybe it's not as risky to ask questions or to show I don't know as I thought it was. Because that's another um, problem I see at a lot of organizations is the stagnation, especially from uh, employees who've been there for a very long time, who are often so set in an old version of the culture that they can inadvertently become hindrances to that culture changing and moving forward, even if they themselves don't think that they are part of the problem. They think that they're victims of these problems. Uh, but when you've been there for a long time, um, you actually do become uh, part of the problem and you're not gonna be challenging it, right? It's like a learned helplessness. So new people can play a really important role in just breaking those open and giving the organization and the leadership an opportunity to uh, show up in a more psychologically safe way. Yeah, really good thoughts. And, you know, I like it too. Just like, what are those simple ways is even being the new person on the team, like that we can role model this. Are there, what are those times that we can actually demonstrate this? I would argue by doing that, I think you would be more assimilated into the team faster and you would actually get held almost like this leadership role, even with your short tenure. And even like you said too, I think it's great to call out the leader when they do some kind of example of a psychological safety moment, like when they, sh they said, oh, I made a mistake here, like, boom, let's double click, let's highlight that, even from the bottom up, I think is super powerful. So really ways that, you know, leaders should be owning this, but if they're not, like, we wanna make sure that no matter who we are on the team, like if we want the team to last and be successful and we care about those, like there's little ways that we can start injecting this into our workflows. And then if we do that on a regular basis, it's just gonna be, become part of our culture. Yeah. So yeah. before we get into some questions here uh, from the audience, from your perspective, Isis, like we talked about all a, a whole sorts of things that we can do and activate. I, you know, I have a half page of notes just from my things that I'm gonna start doing as well from what you're saying. So thank you for that. But like, what would you recommend that we as leaders or people on a team, et cetera, can, can try this week? Is there anything like you would pick out maybe a couple of things like, hey, let's just try this this week to 
understand our psych safety or to improve it that we can get some quick wins on? Well, I think first is you went over some great questions to start asking and start measuring just in how your meetings are running, right? So I think that that's one piece. And then as far as actual behaviors, um, one is to start asking the quote unquote stupid questions, right? L look for questions to ask <laughs> in the room when someone's explaining something or something kind of goes over your head. Um, just just ask the question, say, wait a second, I'm missing something. Can you explain this? Or just just get in the habit of, of starting to ask questions. Uh, that's that's a big one, right? Especially if you have um, some kind of power in the hierarchy in those meetings, uh, that can really um, go a long way. Another one is modeling and rewarding vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are asking uh, someone, hey, uh, where is this thing or what, what's the update from that person or how did this pan out? And they're just like, I don't know, right? But they're, they're being accountable. They're like, I'm going to get you this. I'll get you the answer by the end of the day. I'm sorry, I don't have that information right now to say thank you for your transparency and saying that you don't know. Um, I really appreciate that because that really helps our team run more efficiently, right? Thanking people when they show that vulnerability. When someone asks a question, right, and gets an answer, say, thank you for asking that question. Who knows how many other people, I've seen so many leaders do this, right? It's like, thanks for asking that question. A lot of us had that question, right? Actually, I had that question. So thank you for asking it, right? Just, just thanking people. That's a great way to say, this is the type of culture we want. And then if anyone who sees a, anyone getting a shout out from a manager or a leader, like they're, they're definitely going to be looking for ways to start uh, emulating that behavior. Also speaking in first drafts, you know, that's a phrase I use a lot. Just don't feel like you have to have this very buttoned up, decisive, declarative thing to say. This is a big problem in corporate cultures thinking it's not worth me saying anything if I don't sound decisive and declarative and very, very smart. And I know all the right words, right? Uh, stop doing that, right? Speak in first drafts. Don't go rambling on and take up all the time in the meeting, but just say, I'm not sure how exactly to, to say this or raise this, but I'm just noticing something on this. And, and I, I just want to make sure we're addressing this issue. I don't necessarily have the expertise to speak on it, but I just wanted to put that out there in case anyone else is noticing the same thing, right? Just speaking in first drafts, uh, that can be a great way to start just modeling. It's okay. The stakes are low. You know, this isn't a debate stage, right? You can just share with the team. Um, another one uh, is inviting that feedback and dissenting views and doing it on an ongoing basis, right? And you don't have to do it by by sitting there and be like, does anyone disagree? And <laughs> just like opening it up that way because not everyone is going to want to communicate so directly, but you can do it in your language by saying, call me out if this is a biased perception or you know what, you guys are the ones on the front lines of this work. So, so please challenge me if I'm getting something wrong here or if you think this idea is not going to work, right? Using that kind of language to caveat your ideas and your decisions and using it continuously, it might take a while for people to really think you're serious if you haven't previously been someone who has solicited feedback before. Uh, but when you keep doing it on an ongoing basis and they start to see one or two people point out like, yeah, actually, I don't think that'll work because of xyz and you're like wow that's such useful information for me i didn't know that the frontline experience for you all at ic had changed so much since i was in your position so thank you for sharing that um what are your ideas about how we might be able to do that better right once you start responding that way it's going to be an inflow of information and it's it, as a manager you can manage this in a way that is better for you and the team i think a lot of people get afraid they're just going to get this onslaught of things they have to change but that's your role as the manager is to figure out what does have to change what doesn't have to change what is valid feedback what is not valid feedback that the person might just be missing context and giving that education to the team giving that transparent information and creating a real information flow in all directions um i think one other thing that that i've actually just this is this is personal to me because i did this uh as a manager back in the day and it made such a big difference is follow up with the quiet people right even if you even, even you, if you ask them in the meeting, hey, I haven't heard from you. Do you have anything to say? You can do that. That'll work for some people. But they still might say, um, oh, I'm still thinking or I'm just listening. There are people with such incredible ideas, often they're introverts, and they have such amazing contributions to make, but they just are not very well equipped to make them in a live meeting, thinking on the spot, articulating on the spot question. And I discovered this uh, myself when I was leading a research meeting. It was two hours long. It had a lot of people across a wide range of levels in the meeting. And uh, we were trying to storyline around all this quantitative data that was nationally representative. And we had all this qualitative context that we had to integrate. And there were just several problems in the storyline that we were trying to solve. And all kinds of ideas came up in the meeting, but um, I'm, in my opinion, coming out of it about 
70% of the problems had not been solved well, according to, to how I felt about it. And I noticed that this one quantitative analyst who I knew was really smart, really smart, had to really talk the whole meeting. And so I followed up with her over email. I was like, hey, I know, you know you're the closest to the data. I know you have thoughts about this. I just wanted to give you a chance to share anything. And she literally wrote me, it must have been, if you put in a Word document, like three pages long, bullets, levels, headings, and single-handedly solved like two thirds of the problems um, that had been kind of inadequately addressed in the meeting, much better solutions, much better ideas, much better wording. And because she was a quantitative analyst, it was also much better aligned with the data from a fact check perspective. We weren't gonna run into as many um, issues as we would taking the route from the higher ups who didn't have the data back on how they wanted to approach it. So that was a very humbling moment for me too. Cause I was just like, you know, we're sitting here thinking we're all coming up with the best possible idea by running the meeting this way and collecting information this way. In reality, there's someone sitting right here who could single-handedly solve these problems. They're just not having the values open up to them to provide that information. So that's the last one I would say is follow up with the quiet people and create additional avenues of contribution. Maybe it is just in one-on-ones with you. Maybe you follow up in writing and recognize not everybody contributes the same way. Isis, you are fantastic at your craft. Thank you so much for sharing that. Before we move to a few questions, how do we stay in touch with your work? How do we follow you? How do we keep in touch? Uh, you can find me at isisfabian.com, and I mostly post on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Isis Fabian you'll find if you uh, search me on LinkedIn. So that's the best place to follow me and stay in touch. Wonderful part. Well, thank you so much. Let's jump to the audience. Uh, I know that you see the chat. I'm terrible at multitasking, but there is a bunch of good stuff happening here. So uh, do we have any questions from the crew? Feel free to either drop it in chat or um, I don't know if we can come in, uh, but let us know. We'd love to answer some questions real time. Dan, can I jump in? Um, just because no one has the cameras on or microphones, but I managed to pop a few questions, um, if that's okay. So we have, Really curious um, to hear your views on how people management, views in the people management space around psychological safety. Okay, so um, let me just rephrase this. Um, what about me? The culture and attitude of younger, maybe Gen Z employees. What is your view on managing um, psychological safety from that perspective? So obviously multi-generational teams. Um, that's, that's the one question. The other one we have is around um lack of understanding vision so how do you marry operations and productivity so the actual tangible output with making people still feel safe and heard um third question if i may i'm just gonna pump it out and then you guys can decide how you want to handle it is on the net promoter score and so is it truly effective at measuring employee well-being that's an interesting one and then the last one before I go back to the chats is um, how do leaders project more of the professional side rather than personal bias? So I suppose that would pretty much be like a sort of a debate scenario. I don't agree with you. So maintain being professional and not necessarily react or, or have some sort of personal bias to that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So apologies. That's what I have. Start the intergenerational question, because <laughs> a lot of my work is about this kind of marrying of the, the generations. And um, again, the superiority concept can become a big problem when you have older generations thinking, we know more, we know best, because we're older and we've been here longer. And then younger people just will never agree with that and will think, no, you're old, you don't know what you're talking about. And so you're always going to have that tension when that kind of attitude is there. But what I've seen and what I think we all will not be surprised to hear is there are pros and cons, right, that every single generation is bringing into the workplace from a cultural standpoint. I think one of the biggest shifts we've seen from Gen Z, and this started with millennials, <clears throat> and it really started with the, the bleeding of work into our personal lives, right, is what we talk about uh, in the workplace. And I've seen this come up, especially when I work with organizations that have um, staff who are in their 60s versus uh, staff who are in their early 20s and they have to work together. And there's this big disconnect in terms of what is considered professional to talk about at work. If someone does say something racist, right? There is a generation that feels like that's inappropriate for you to say something about that. It's actually rude of you to point out racism in front of other people, things like that. So I've seen a lot of um, tension there where we just do not have shared 
uh, cultural operating norms. And that's something that uh, leaders of these teams and ideally, you know, of these broader organizations get explicit about, right? You should have a set of explicit expectations around psychological safety and not just saying we are psychologically safe. (laughs) That is one of our values, right? To have a clear set of uh, behaviors and expectations, you know, we hold each other accountable. What does that actually look like? And understanding that these aspects of identity, especially as people have, um, are, you know, the workforce is more diverse than ever, you know, younger generations are more likely to be trans across the LGBTQIA spectrum and also neurodivergent. So there's just these things that affect people's work and their lived experience that need to be talked about in the workplace and be addressed. So I think, uh, addressing those those differences like requires a lot of humility and um, just being honest with younger people being willing to say oh you shouldn't behave that way because of xyz and if they push back and say that doesn't make sense or that's not fair or that's oppressive or whatever to be prepared to have that conversation and recognize that maybe there are some things that have to change in your organizational norms and and culture is there anything uh, from the other questions or from that question that you want to respond to dan uh, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll, let me take one and then we'll just kind of wrap up since we're short on time, but would love to keep in touch because I feel like there's so many great questions here. I'll take the NPS. Is that an effective way to measure uh, culture? Um, um, and my, uh, I would compare this to other organiz- or other departments within our team. If we look at gross profit margin, is that going to give us a full picture of our overall financial performance? If we look at closed one only value for sales, is that going to give us uh, a full picture of our sales performance? No. We want for financial performance, we want to look at gross net revenue, we want to look at profit margin, we want to look at EBITDA. You know, there's so many different elements that we need to look at to get a full picture on how our culture is performing. Same with culture. We should, there is such a lack of data and understanding and focus on our people teams in general, of course. I would argue the people here are probably well ahead of the masses here, but we need to inject a lot more how we approach other departments into our people teams. So NPS should be one thing we're looking at, employee net promoter score specifically. Um, but there, I would encourage to look at, hey, what are the things that we can measure that really feed into any and all high performing teams, but how are those things then relating to behavior? I always argue culture equals behavior. And so we can measure from here until Sunday, uh, all the things that we want, but they mean nothing unless we're truly doing something about them. So start to look at things, not just EMPS, but look at things like measuring psychological safety, measure trust, measure productivity, measure innovation, measure resilience. These pieces we know feed into any and all of high performing teams, but they're also tied to behaviors. So we can change those behaviors and then augment the team. So, you know, my charge to, you know, respond to this question too, is just like, let's start treating our people and our people departments and teams the same as we're treating any other department. We can't just look at a single way and, you know, oh, a check in the box. Like if we really want to augment our culture, we need to look at it several ways like we're doing with the other departments. So with that, we should probably wrap up because we're three minutes out, but I do feel like we could keep, keep jamming for quite some time. But it's been such a fun journey through, you know, psychological safety. I hope, you know, these insights have ignited some new perspectives within each of us. I know it has me every time I connect with Cassandra and Isis. I have several pages of notes and things that I can do. So as we wrap up, we know that high performing teams isn't just something we should sit back and wait till it happens to us. It's really something we can own and shape ourselves. So with all the brilliant minds on this call, I would also charge all of us to be a part of shaping a future where, you know, the imagination exercise we did at the beginning of what being on a team embodying psychological safety looks and feels like isn't just a nice thing we're talking about at the beginning of a webinar, but it's the reality of our work and our team. So let's take these learnings, reflect on them, and then let's dare to implement for it's in the application of what we learned today that transformation takes root. So I extend my gratitude to Isis, OmniHR, Cassandra. Thank you so much for having us. And then Scott and Lisa for hosting us in the chat. Let's continue these conversations beyond the virtual space. So please feel free to reach out, share your thoughts, and let's all push the boundaries of what we think possible. Thanks, Dan and Isis. Isis, before we let you go, it was a really cool comment. Did you write a book? Are you planning on it? Did you publish one? Are you going to? Because Pete, I have heard this so many times in the past couple of weeks. So I am I am in conversations with with parties to make this happen because I would love to. So I'm working on it. Fantastic. We're gonna hold you to it. This is recorded, by the way. So we'll give you about a year and we'll check back. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan and Isis, and thank you to everyone that's taken the time this evening or this morning, good afternoon, to join us. The session is going to be recorded. Please look out for the replay of this evening. There's been such a lot of golden nuggets. 
these are my notes. I don't think you can see it. And I feel like I've still missed so much. So I'm going to have to go and replay this again to listen. I really think you guys have left us with food for thought on what to go and do tomorrow. Perhaps not immediately tangible, but just basic behavior, asking questions, providing context and being sure to be humble when we listen to our teams more so than speak to our teams. It's really just listen. So appreciate your time. We'll be online for another minute or so before we actually cut. So if there's any last um, comments or questions, please put that through and our panelists will get through to that the moment they get a chance. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.